Hey, Retcon Raider here. Well, we're into the new year, and now that the holidays are over, things are finally starting to slow down a little. And I've got some extra time to go back and talk about a few of the other games that have recently crossed my radar. That said, today, I thought we'd take a quick look at a game I actually spent a fair amount of time playing back in late 2019. Today, I thought we'd talk about Wildermyth by World Waker Games. So, what is Wildermyth? Well, that's actually a somewhat tricky question, but I guess the quickest description might be a procedurally generated turn-based tactical RPG with a unique fantasy setting, and a rather heavy focus on things like story progression and character development. Honestly, Wildermyth is a very unusual game. While several of the general concepts may be fairly familiar, they're impressively intertwined with a procedural narrative storytelling system. Essentially, Wildermyth's a game that is, first and foremost, about creating stories about the characters you recruit, with the actual adventures you embark upon, the monsters you fight, and the riches you amass, largely just serving as a catalyst to help drive those stories. From a gameplay standpoint, Wildermyth is pretty straightforward. The game is played in chapters, with each chapter being broken down into a series of randomized events and combat encounters spread out over a relatively small world map. The player gets a handful of procedurally generated adventurers to start with, and they're given one or two basic goals to accomplish. Depending on the scenario, these goals are usually pretty straightforward, such as investigating a specific location, killing a certain number of enemies, or simply surviving for a set amount of time. Once these goals are accomplished, the chapter will come to an end. Now, individually, the encounters that make up each chapter tend to be fairly simple. Each time a player investigates a new area, they will often be confronted by a semi-randomized event. Some of these will be purely narrative in nature, but most will result in some sort of penalty or reward based on the player's decision. Many of these encounters will also result in combat, but locations will rarely include more than a single combat encounter. Once combat has been initiated, the player will find their current party move to a basic square-based combat grid on a procedurally generated map. Most battles tend to be relatively small and self-contained, with the player fielding up to five adventurers at a time and rarely facing off against more than a dozen enemy units. While combat in Wildermyth isn't particularly groundbreaking, it is both functional and intuitive. At its core, it's your basic two-action combat system. In fact, if you're already familiar with games like Pathfinder or Dungeons & Dragons, or even the more recent XCOM games, then you probably already have a pretty good idea of how it works. Basically, each unit gets two action points per turn, which are then used to move, attack, or take a variety of other basic actions. Actions can be taken in any order, but attacking an opponent will immediately end a unit's turn. There are also special swift actions, such as opening doors, interacting with objects, or performing various special class abilities. A swift action basically costs half of one action point to use. However, it is worth noting that there are a few minor but interesting twists on how this all works. While the game includes basic concepts like taking cover behind terrain objects or flanking enemy units, it also makes use of a few less conventional mechanics, such as granting defensive bonuses when two allies are standing adjacent to each other. There are also a variety of special abilities that characters can obtain, which will allow them to bend or even outright break the normal rules. Even more intriguing is the Interfusion ability, which only mages can use. This allows mages to essentially infuse their life essence into nearby terrain objects. Doing this will allow them to remotely perceive the area around that object, allowing them to quickly and efficiently scout remote areas. More notably, 
It can then be used to effectively detonate that object, triggering a special attack based on both the size and nature of the object that they were interfused with. This can lead to a surprisingly diverse array of results. For example, a mage who interfuses with a burning brazier could cause the fire to literally leap across the battlefield, not only setting a nearby space ablaze, but also scorching any creatures caught in the fire's travel arc. They could also hobble an opponent with ropes, blind them with an exploding lantern, douse them with boiling oil, or simply shower them with wooden shrapnel or dangerously sharpened debris. This helps turn an otherwise mundane skirmish into a surprisingly enjoyable and tactical experience, as the player not only uses terrain objects as cover, but also as potential weapons. A companion with a torch could actively light more fires for the mage to control, allowing them to quickly set an entire enemy legion ablaze. A clever player can strategically detonate objects to deprive opponents of cover, or to create convenient shortcuts for allies. Now, each time a player successfully completes a combat encounter, they'll gain a few immediate short-term benefits in the form of both experience and equipment. Equipment is fairly basic, granting stat modifiers, modifying appearances, but also binding to the first character who equips it. Experience points can grant additional levels over time, with each new level up providing access to one new active or passive ability. These abilities are doled out semi-randomly, in groups of three, drawn from both a generic pool as well as a class pool specific to that character. Warriors will become tougher and stronger, hunters will become faster and trickier, and mages will often learn new ways to use their interfusion ability on the battlefield. However, it is important to remember that the enemy units will also grow more powerful over time. Most combat encounters and some non-combat encounters will grant enemy factions a randomized long-term buff once the encounter or event has been resolved. This can include making one of the faction's units more powerful, or add an entirely new type of unit to that faction's roster. The enemy factions will also naturally grow stronger with the passage of time, and eventually, they'll even start trying to retake territories that the player has already secured. Thankfully, there are some ways that the player can prevent the enemies from growing too powerful. One of the player's most valuable resources, aside from their adventurers, are legacy points, special rewards granted to the player over time. These are most commonly acquired by capturing and securing new territory on the world map, but can also sometimes be obtained through events or even special combat encounters. These legacy points can be used to negate certain enemy upgrades, or even to block an enemy invasion, at least temporarily. This can allow the player some degree of control over how an enemy faction will develop, but trying to cancel out every enemy upgrade or activity is prohibitively expensive. The player will also want to be careful about how they ration out their legacy points, because these are also required for other vital functions as well, such as recruiting new adventurers or building special upgrades on captured territories. This is the player's primary means of preparing in advance for an often uncertain future. In Wildermyth, your average campaign is actually pretty short, generally spanning just three to five chapters long. Each chapter only takes an hour or two to complete, but in-game, they represent years or even decades worth of time. It's important for the player to try to balance their efforts between immediate short-term gain and long-term investment. Otherwise, they're apt to find themselves overwhelmed when the campaign reaches its end, and the penultimate threat finally rears its ugly head. This, of course, brings us to what feels like the actual focus of the game, the fairly robust character system. Every adventurer the player recruits is procedurally generated, though the player can change their name, customize their appearance, and even choose their basic class. What they can't change, however, 
Is that character's background or personality two things that will have a particularly heavy influence on how that character will interact with the world around them? A loner, for example, will often end up pushing his companions away, while a character with a dark heart might instead be more prone to making particularly destructive decisions. A goofball might help keep their companion's spirits up, but could very well end up annoying them instead, and their constant tomfoolery might even end up putting the rest of the party in danger. It's important to remember that characters will not only grow older and more powerful over time, but they'll also often find themselves changed in some way by the things that they encounter. This can be something as simple as forging a staunch friendship or bitter rivalry with a fellow adventurer, or perhaps even falling in love. But it can also encompass more disastrous events, such as being maimed in battle or cursed by some vile creature. For better or worse, all of these events will end up leaving their mark on a character, further influencing how they develop over time. For example, fostering a strong relationship between two characters might provide benefits to both, but could also result in harsher penalties if one of them ends up passing away. Accepting a blessing from an arcane creature could very well result in burning brighter in the short term but at the cost of burning out faster as well, ensuring that the character in question will never live long enough to see the campaign through to the end. Perhaps most intriguing, a character who is struck down in battle might end up surviving, but bearing the permanent scars of their defeat. While this can lead to some pretty severe penalties, such as reduced movement or restricting what equipment they can use, it will often come with new opportunities as well, potentially bending up even stronger than they might have otherwise been. Now, it is entirely possible to end up circumventing these sorts of losses by using the in-game save system, which does allow the player to manually save and reload as much as they desire. Still, it's worth noting that, as with most other things in Wildermyth, even the most negative events can still end up being opportunities in disguise. While save scumming will allow a player to spare their characters some heartache in the short term, it also deprives them of the potential growth that they might have otherwise experienced. Of course, ultimately, every adventurer's life must come to an end, and in a game like Wildermyth, where campaigns can often span the course of generations, Things like death and retirement are an inevitability. The player will often be confronted with decisions that will force them to choose between short and long-term benefits, including the fates of their allies. Fighting monsters and hoarding riches might help save a village in the short run, but it will often take a much more monumental effort, or a much more noble sacrifice, to actually save the world. That said, Wildermyth is a game about building myths and legends. In the end, once the story is done, all of the player's surviving characters, including the ones who retired, will be added to their legacy pool. This will allow the player to call upon them once more during subsequent campaigns, albeit at a steeper cost and in a somewhat diminished form. After all, legends are often exaggerated over time, and so it is with the heroes and champions of your former campaigns. Still, with enough time and perseverance, a player can build a complex and storied mythology of their own, complete with a wide variety of martyrs and heroes, those who gave their lives to ensure a few more precious years of peace, and those who survived, but were forever changed by the things that they encountered. Now, from a presentation standpoint, the game uses a fairly distinct paper doll style, somewhat reminiscent of the cardboard standees that are sometimes used with board games or with some tabletop RPGs. The art is colorful but somewhat basic, and the sometimes crude drawings can be a bit distracting. Personally, while it did end up setting my initial expectations fairly low, it actually ended up growing on me over time. Now I uh, 
well, now I find it charming. As for the music, well, again, what's there is just fine. More than fine, really. Again, I think individual mileage may vary, but I will say that the variety can be a little lacking. The game tends to rely pretty heavily on the same set of six or so tracks, but they're all relatively short. It's made all the more notable by the fact that you're likely to end up hearing most of those tracks dozens or even hundreds of times throughout the course of a single campaign. Honestly, though, I think that's my only real complaint about the game. A lack of variety in general. Don't get me wrong, what's there is good, but it definitely feels like it could use a little more in certain areas. For example, while there are literally hundreds of events you can discover, you're likely to start seeing a lot of repeated events a little bit too quickly. It also feels odd that, for a game that puts so much stress on character development, there are only three classes to choose from, and everyone is human by default. This might be a deliberate choice on the part of the developers, with the idea being that it's the events and experiences that are intended to help differentiate one character from another, but it does still feel like a missed opportunity. Still, to be fair, it is important to note that, as of the moment I'm recording this, Wildermyth is still in early access. The developers are currently putting out new updates on a bi-weekly basis, with a focus on providing more events, additional consequences for existing events, and eventually even some entirely new campaigns. It also appears that the game is being developed with mod support in mind. The devs have already provided some basic tools for content creation, and have even included a basic tutorial campaign designed to help explain how players can create their own adventures. The developers are hoping to improve those tools over time, but there's already a modest number of interesting mods to choose from, introducing a variety of new events, items, and even some new enemies into the game. So, with all that in mind, would I personally recommend Wildermyth? Well, I think this is one of those rare cases where I can answer that with a resounding yes. Sure, the content might be slightly lacking at the moment, but that's something the developers are still actively working on, and something which will be even further improved on as we start seeing more and more user-made content. The visual presentation is basic, but charming, and the audio is gorgeous, though again, it could use slightly more variety. What is there is surprisingly well-polished, and incredibly solid for an early access title. I've already logged over 30 hours into the game, and I don't think I've ever encountered any significant bugs. I also really didn't find myself worrying about repetition until I was well into my third campaign, and given that the game retails for a rather modest 20 US dollars, I think it's pretty safe to say that I'm satisfied with my purchase. Besides, it also gave me a lot of interesting stories to tell. And, like I said, that's kind of the whole point of Wildermyth. Of course, as usual, you don't have to take my word for it. If you think Wildermyth looks like the sort of game that you might enjoy, I strongly encourage you to go check it out for yourself. You can find out more about Wildermyth on the official website, the official development blog, the official Discord server, the official Twitter feed, or the official store page over on Steam. As always, links are in the description. <laughs>